The uh, final fiscal update provides a snapshot of our current fiscal situation at this point in time uh, in the 2019-2020 fiscal year, which, end, which ends on March 31st, uh, 2020. Uh, today is an opportunity um, to show what the Department has examined um, and how we are tracking against the projections in Budget 2019. Unlike the budget, uh, the mid-year update shows only where we are in our current fiscal year. It doesn't contemplate uh, our fiscal projections for the years beyond 2019-20. We have a sense of where we are uh, and will be in the future, and I plan to address that at the end of my remarks today. But it isn't possible to undertake the rigor of a multi-year budget projection uh, twice in one year. These projections are based on extremely detailed analysis, uh, which is why we do it as part of the budget process. So I want to talk about what we've accomplished. In 2016, government set out on an ambitious plan to return to surplus by 2022-23. And we have made significant progress against this plan. We've reduced the annual deficit from over $2 billion in 2015-16 to just under $550 million in 2018-19. After a 10-year period, we're spending increased by over 50 percent. Over the past four years, our spending has only grown by 2 percent. Considering the current rate of inflation is roughly 2 percent a year, an increase of 2 percent over four years is significant cost control. Part of the increase in expenditures is made up of federally fully funded programs. This fiscal year, we've had approximately $130 million uh, in spending in which we are fully reimbursed, but this still shows as part of our expenditure line. Uh, the tr true increase to our spending is actually lower than the 2% when you factor this in. We also had to deal with increased investment and borrowing uh, by the provincial government for Muskrat Falls. As part of this increase, we've had close to $100 million in interest alone for this fiscal year. And yet, we've still kept spending flat. We've also worked hard to reduce the size of the public service by over 900 positions. We've worked closely with industry to attract more than 16 billion in investment, and we've collaborated with industry partners in agriculture, aquaculture, advanced technology, and the tourism sectors on action plans to expand operations in these key industries. We are also working to expand the aerospace industry in this province, and that work has already started. All of these areas will help expand and diversify the economy, creating jobs in both the short and longer terms. The oil industry remains an important part of our economic future, with significant growth opportunities in supply and service businesses, as well as employment. We had made, as a government, difficult decisions in 2016, but as we've progressed in our fiscal plan, we've worked hard to reduce the tax burden on the people of our province. We have removed the tax on automobile insurance. We've made changes to the payroll tax for employers, and the temporary deficit reduction levy will be gone in two weeks. It is important to remember what we've done as we look forward to Budget 2020. Looking to the fiscal update, today we are revising our projected surplus for 2019-20 to $1.56 billion. This is a reduction of $368.7 million from Budget 2019. On the expense side, we have held things relatively flat with an overall net savings on expenses of $24 million. We control what we can control, and this speaks to our cost control measures. The change 
that we've seen in the surplus as a result of lower than projected revenues, which are uh, off track by $393 million. There are several factors contributing to this change. As I've stated previously, the Hibernia shutdowns had an impact of $185 million. Um, last fiscal year, we also faced an impact from the CROs shutdown of $80 million, uh, which was also a deferral in revenue. These incidents are outside our control, and the priority when they occur is the health and safety of our workers and the environmental protection. While this revenue is deferred, it is not lost. The short-term impact on our finances, however, is significant. The average oil price to date is approximately $64.43 a barrel, but it is expected to be lower for the remainder of the fiscal year. The impact of this lower price is a reduction of $46 million to our original projections. The revised oil price forecast for the remainder of 2019-20, we have set at $63 a barrel. The U.S.-Canada exchange rate is being revised from $0.77 cents on a dollar to $0.76 cents on a dollar. In addition to the deferred revenue from the oil industry, some of the remaining impacts on oil revenues are a result of the systemic issues uh, with the way the federal government and provinces share revenue. The remaining, uh, the remaining variance is a result mostly due to revised tax estimates and changes to the payment methodology from Finance Canada, as well as adjustments to federal cost-shared programs and infrastructure projects. Despite these revenue issues, our borrowing needs for 2019-20 are unchanged from budget 2019. The revenue picture shows once again that the volatility of natural resource revenues and the fact that the current federal programs meant to overcome revenue shifts are not responsive to the realities of resource producing provinces. Our position on the federal equalization program is well documented as it does not address these issues. I will give credit to the current federal administration uh, who have recognized that the challenges we face and the issues of the current systems. They are working with us on rate mitigation efforts and have expressed a willingness to work with all provinces on solutions outside of the equalization formula, such as the Fiscal Stabilization Fund. The next few months are a critical juncture in our fiscal plan. If we see progress on these files before Budget 2020, it creates a much more positive uh, picture. As the Premier stated, we expect to provide an update on rate mitigation discussions early in the new year. I'll close my remarks today with a few words about our return to surplus. For several weeks, I faced questions about what cuts I plan to make and about what cuts are in the fiscal forecast. Let me be clear, I've never said cuts were coming. In fact, I've always preached a balanced approach that maintains important services while focusing on savings that grow over time. We have been completely forthright. The spending reductions in our fiscal plan are based on savings we anticipate from various initiatives that we've put in place to save money over time. Shared services, digital government, attrition, zero-based budgeting, changes to post-employment benefits, the elimination of severance, and better management in areas such as reducing the size of government's vehicle fleet and the leased space that government occupies, as well as many others. One challenge we face, however, is that some of these programs are not achieving savings as quickly as we would have hoped. Furthermore, our progress is undeniable. We are facing significant challenges above and beyond those impacting our fiscal update. Some of these challenges are historical, such as providing adequate services to a dispersed population spread over a very large landmass. Our population challenges are well established, and many of the decisions that some people would like me to make 
could further exacerbate those challenges. We have newer pressures such as our net debt and the challenges we are facing from Muskrat Falls project and our rate mitigation needs. We remain committed to our plans and we are also exploring all possibilities and possible means of speeding up the anticipated savings and addressing those challenges. I'm not giving up on our return to surplus in 2022-23, but I want to be clear about the challenges we face in achieving that goal. I make no apologies for our balanced approach. There are no easy decisions in this process because no decision happens in a vacuum and everything we do has multiple impacts that cascade through the economy. In closing, I've heard public commentary, including from opposition members, they want to collaborate on finding solutions. I accept that the opposition should be critical, but I challenge it to be constructive criticism with a consistent message. The message cannot be cut expenses, but not in my district. As late as yesterday, uh, we saw an opposition news release uh, asking that the English school district not review schools with a population as little as three individuals. Most days we hear demands to increase expenditures, but we never hear ideas on how to reduce those expenditures. I will say that true collaboration means tackling the hard issues in addition to discussing spending priorities. Uh, this budget, I believe, will be a good barometer on whether uh, the will to collaborate is stronger than the desire to gain political points.